Hello and welcome back. Today's lecture is going to be on the War of 1812. Uh, the War of 1812 is a war between the British and the Americans uh, and is, you know, kind of inevitable, I think. The, the British, when they lost the Revolutionary War, they never really believed that the American experiment would last. Uh, they were very reluctant to give up forts out west and western territory. And as a matter of fact, still have functioning, uh, you know, uh, forts out there prior to the War of 1812. Uh, you know, they have been instigating Native Americans in the west as well to cause problems for the Americas. Uh, they have you know, been impressing American sailors out in uh, the ocean. Uh, they've been uh, doing everything they can to, you know, uh, make it difficult for America. They're really trying to, you know, strangle the baby in the cradle. The baby being America, right? And and what I mean by that is America, because it's young, it's very, very vulnerable. And uh, the British recognize that. And so uh, they're you know, they, they've been doing things uh, that are kind of designed to, you know, undermine America. Now, that being said, it is going to be America who strikes first here, uh, at least officially strikes first, uh, even though there's lots of instigation by the British. So, uh, you know, essentially, uh, you know, Americans believed, uh, you know, particularly, uh, you know, people like Henry Clay uh, that are out West, uh, they believe that the British are, you know, essentially encouraging Native Americans to attack settlers. Uh, we know, I mean, they keep finding British guns in the hands of Native Americans. And so we know where the guns are coming from. Uh, we know that, that it is actually happening the British are using their resources and they have a lot of resources uh, to uh, help the Native Americans, uh, you know, fight uh, the Americans. Uh, the uh, impressment of sailors out on the East Coast is uh, something very similar. Remember impressment from previous lectures, it's when the British essentially kidnap American sailors and force them into the British Navy. And so you start to get people like Henry Clay of Kentucky, uh, John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, who are known as war hawks. Uh, those are people who, uh, you know, uh, promote war, uh, that they're encouraging war with Great Britain. They uh, really feel like uh, war is necessary to stop the British support of Native Americans, to stop impressment, but also, let's be honest, uh, they're also eyeballing Canada. The British, Canada is theirs, right? And it has been for, you know, a, quite some time now. And, you know, we kind of, you know, want that land. And so, uh, you know, the uh, reality is uh, there are other kind of selfish reasons uh, for wanting to w war with the British, uh, as long as some very legitimate reasons uh, that the, you know, the British are using the Native Americans to attack us and they are kidnapping our sailors. So uh, what will, you know, end up really happening is these things and, you know, going back to the Chesapeake with, uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson from previous lecture, uh, these things are really going to upset the uh, American people. You know, nobody wants to see uh, American sailors being kidnapped by the British. Uh, the British are also attacking us economically with uh, these uh, what are called orders of council, uh, which are meant to restrict trade between the United States and France. Essentially, uh, what the orders of council say is that the British reserve the right to intercept any ships that are trying to trade with the French and essentially seize their cargo. I mean, can you imagine that today if some country thought that they have the right to just jack our ships and, and take all the supplies off it? I mean, we, you know, we would never, ever tolerate that. Uh, and so the British, they know that they've got the strongest Navy in the world and America's got all the a really very, very, very small Navy, uh, nothing to really speak of. Uh, although Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry is going to you know, do wonders with, uh, you know, a very, very tiny Navy. Uh, but the British know they, they can push us around and they're pushing us around. And, uh, you know, the American people are getting fed up with it. 
And so uh, in 1812, President Madison uh, is going to recommend a war and we're going to get a resolution. And uh, shortly thereafter, uh, you know, we're going to declare war on you know, Great Britain because of the native attacks and impressment. And we're going to invade Canada. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the invasion won't be as successful as we thought it was going to be, even though we will take some land, the Canadian land uh for a very short period of time. So uh, what's this war gonna look like? Well, uh, it's not gonna look so hot for the Americans. America has a very, very small army and Navy. Remember, uh, Adams built up the army and the, the Navy during the XYZ affair, but then when Jefferson took office, you know, he was a believer in small government, uh, he cut the Na army and Navy. And so uh, the we, we've actually just shrunk our army and Navy. So we're not in a great place uh, to fight, you know, the, the world's premier military in uh, Great Britain. You know, this is essentially round two, right? And we've got essentially no allies. Uh, you know, we'll be able to convince some Native Americans uh, to help us out, but most of the Native Americans will side with uh, the British. And so, uh, you know, the French aren't lining up because uh, we didn't help, uh, haven't been, you know, helpful of them with uh, their fights in Europe. So, uh, Great Britain has the strongest Navy on Earth. They've got one of the best trained uh, expeditionary forces uh, on Earth as well. And they will have uh, help from the natives, primarily Tecumseh. Tecumseh has been able to unite significant portions of Native American tribes and uh, essentially say, hey, look, this is our best shot to get our own country. The British will promise a an autonomous Native American uh, country for uh, Tecumseh and all his followers at the conclusion of this war. And so uh, the British objective is essentially to, you know, recolonize America, uh, take over that territory again. And then all the land where, you know, there aren't uh, American settlers, they're just going to give the, all the rest of that land out west to Tecumseh. And so Tecumseh says, that's too good to turn down. Uh, I'm going to take that deal. And ends up fighting alongside the British. So, oh, by the way, uh, just to let you know, the uh, when this war doesn't go exactly the way that the uh, British wanted to, they're totally going to sell out the natives and it will be at. So, America quickly invades Canada. We see, you know, some success, not as much as we had hoped, but the British are able to very quickly push us back. They've maintained forts in Canada and out west for a very long time. And so uh, they have the infrastructure to push us back and they do. Uh, and so they're going to uh, be able to uh, very quickly capture Fort Detroit, uh, and they do that without firing a shot. They essentially just surround it and the before it essentially has to give up. Uh, they're going to take control of the Great Lakes, essentially. I mean, that's devastating for us because if you control the Great Lakes back then, I mean, you, you control, uh, you can very easily divide the country up. And so you can, uh, you know, the, the Great Lakes feed in the Mississippi River. And then, I mean, that just is, is can be disastrous for us. And so... Uh, you know, this is uh, this is definitely not good for America. Now, uh, we are going to see uh, some uh, great leadership from the uh, American Navy uh, through Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry. Uh, Hazard Perry is going to, through some really great maneuvering, he's going to be able to, you know, he has an inferior force of smaller ships, but he's going to use uh, the, the fact that his force is smaller to his advantage. And so the British are going to be a little audacious uh, because because they know that they have bigger, badder ships. Uh, but Perry's able to kind of use shallower uh, water to be able to uh, maneuver his ships in ways that the bigger British ships can't. Uh, and because of that, he's going to be able to ambush the British uh, in the in the Great Lakes, uh, you know, in, on several occasions, that's uh, that's going to give him some really uh, great victories, uh, and he will he will win a substantial victory uh, at Lake Erie. Once we control Lake Erie, we can then pull our ships into uh, range of Detroit uh, and 
we can uh, retake Fort Detroit. We can surround it. This then gives us control over the, the Northwest Territory. So all that kind of Ohio uh, region, uh, that, that is, you know, crucially important. And so uh, we're able to retake Detroit at the Battle of the Thames. And uh, when that happens, uh, that's a devastating loss, not necessarily for the British, because the British are going to have some more victories here and some very important ones. But it's a devastating loss for Native Americans because they're going to lose their leader, Tecumseh. Native Americans uh, are uh, when we they lose the Battle of Detroit. Their you know their best braves uh, are going to be killed or captured, and their uniter Tecumseh, the one that was able to get you know many of these young Native Americans to set aside tribal differences to unite against the United States, uh, he's dead now. And so uh, Native American unity is going to be much more difficult after the death of uh, Tecumseh. And then, you know, the Tecumseh also had a, a good relationship with the British. And so, you know, this is going to make it more likely uh, later on down the road for the British to sell out the natives. And, and we'll talk about that uh, after uh, the, the Battle of New Orleans. Well, actually, before the Battle of New Orleans with the Treaty of Ghent, a weird thing happens there. So uh, the British uh, are going to be able to, the British and the French have been fighting in Europe for a long time now, and the British are actually able to defeat the French. And when that happens, uh-oh, we in some trouble, because now the British uh, aren't using the majority of their military fighting in Europe and just sending kind of leftovers over to the United States. Now they can focus their entire attention over on the United States, uh, and that's not going to be good. And so uh, an influx of British soldiers comes to the United States. And when that happens, we're in some trouble. Uh, they're going to uh, you know, land here in the United States, essentially march on to Washington and really kind of just steamroll Washington. Uh, James Madison and his wife Dolly uh, are, you know, the president and the first lady are forced to flee the capital. Now, Dolly Madison is pretty prescient here, right? She's predicting the future. And she's like, this isn't good. And, you know, she recognizes there's all kinds of very important uh, artwork in the White House. Uh, and she is going to uh, essentially order that that stuff be removed from the White House and be saved. And so a lot of the very important historical uh, pieces are going to be able to escape the the White House because of uh, Dolly Madison. We uh, we really should thank her for that. And the British uh, will essentially be able to roll right into Washington D.C. They're actually going to light the White House on fire. I mean, think about how symbolic that is. The Capitol has now fallen. The president has. Uh, fled. There's now a government in exile in the United States, and the White House, like the seat of power and the symbol of you know American authority, is now on fire. And so this is just not a good thing for the United States. Now, war's not over. We're still fighting. I and mean, remember, this is like we declared war first, even though we were instigated into it. Uh, we declared war first. We thought we were going to snatch up Canada, and now we've lost significant territory. The next target that the British have is going to be uh, the port at Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore, the port of Baltimore is super important. It is one of the um, biggest, deepest water ports on the East Coast, and so uh, it can move all kinds of goods because it's so uh, deep and the, the port's so big. You can move all kinds of materials in and out of Baltimore, and if the British get a hold of that, they're going to just be able to dump in soldiers and resources in, uh, into this fight. That's going to make the fight much more difficult, but even more important, it's going to stop uh, America from being able to use these resources and can potentially cut the country in half. And so this is devastating. But the port is defended at Fort McHenry. Uh, and uh, because it is, uh, you know, being Fort McHenry is there, uh, the British have to be able to destroy that fort before they can get their ships into uh, port. And so what you'll see is a 25-hour bombardment of 
Fort McHenry. And uh, while that's happening, right, the, the, the soldiers are being attacked. Everybody in Baltimore suspects that this is, uh, you know, that this fort is going to fall. Francis Scott Key is out on a British ship and he's like negotiating for, you know, uh, uh, prisoners on this British ship. And he sees from the British ship the bomb bombardment of Fort McHenry and it really realizes if Fort McHenry falls, Baltimore falls, if Baltimore falls with in the conjunction of, uh, of Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, this is going to be just it. And, um, you know, we, we might lose this war. And so it's like kind of this devastating thing. But then uh, in the morning when, you know, he looks out after this massive bombardment and he sees that the fort is still standing and that these uh, soldiers have uh, hoisted this just a massive American flag, uh, it's going to inspire him later to write the national anthem. Uh, you know, the bomb bursting in the air, you know, you know the deal. Um, you know, and so, uh, you know, it really becomes this inspiring moment and we're going to be able to turn back the the British here. And this keeps America in the fight. And it's starting to signal to the British that this is going to be a very long and expensive fight. You know, and the, the British, when they're looking at this fight here, you know, they know that that America is it going to be the 13 colonies again, right? You know, our economy is developed enough, we're, we're far enough away that the, the end game for the British can't be total dominance of, of America anymore. That's just not practical and it's too expensive. And so the, there are people within the British empire that are starting to recognize that this fight is not gonna be an easy victory that because Fort McHenry held out and, and Fort Detroit has been retaken, that this fight might go on and on. The British are exhausted from war in Europe. Uh, they really don't have the money to spend on this kind of endeavor. And so, you know, there starts to be resistance to this war uh, in Great Britain. And so uh, even though right now it looks like because of the sacking of Washington that, you know, the British are on a roll and, and America's in trouble internally, domestically in Great Britain, you know, there's talk about this is maybe not such a great idea for Great Britain. Britain. Now, at the same time, uh, you're going to see Northeasterners who are getting hit particularly hard by this war. Remember, when this war started, it was because Native Americans were attacking settlers out west. Well, what does a, a Northeastern businessman really care about that? They don't, right? And so these Northeastern businessmen are like, man, we started this war because the Natives are attacking settlers out west, but where's most of the fighting been? The most of the devastating fighting has been in the Northeast, right? Washington is burned. And so, uh, you know, these Northern uh, businessmen are like this. Uh, this war may not might not be worth it. Uh, and most of these guys, because they're Northeastern businessmen, they're Federalists, right? And they're going to get together because they feel like they've been suffering the most from this war. Uh, they're going to get together uh, and they're going to start to talk about maybe we should leave the union if uh you know you know if most of these other states southern and western states if they want to go to war because of what's happening over there well that doesn't affect us and maybe we should just leave the union uh the belief is that the constitution was written by delegations from the states the states had to ratify it and so if states, individual states ever wanted to leave the union, maybe they could, um, you know, they sh should have the right. That's kind of what the Hartford uh, Convention says. Now, ultimately, they are going to decide against leaving the United States. Uh, this is gonna have two important consequences. One, it's the death of the Federalist Party, right? Uh, we're gonna walk away from this war essentially as a draw. We're gonna call it a victory because of what happens in New Orleans, uh, but it is essentially a draw. Uh, you know, No territory will exchange hands, but the British will continue to impress American soldiers, so nothing really changed, um, with the exception of the decimation of you know Tecumseh and his braves. But, uh, you know, because it comes out a draw uh, and we didn't lose and the Federalists uh, in, at the Hartford Convention talked about leaving the Union, they are looked at as 
essentially betraying the country. And so the Federalist Party essentially dies because of the Hartford Convention. Uh, the second important thing that happens is the argument that the Federalists make here is states decided to, to uh, join the Union so states can decide to leave the Union. That argument is going to be the argument that the South will later use to secede from the Union during the Civil War. And so we already kind of see the legal arguments uh, being laid out for states' ability to, uh, to, to leave the Union. So we're already kind of laying the groundwork for the, the Civil War here. So uh, the British who recognize that, you know, maybe they don't want to be fighting this war anymore, uh, that everybody sends out feelers about, you know, maybe peace talks and uh, the Americans and the British meet in a neutral country, Belgium, a place called Ghent, uh, to start to negotiate peace. And so uh, both sides are negotiating peace while the war is still being fought in America. Uh, the British knew that they couldn't really keep fighting this war forever. It was just too expensive. So they're willing to negotiate peace. The Americans, because, you know, clearly we were on the East Coast anyway, we're getting whooped. Uh, we actually start to lessen our demands. Uh, and so uh, we actually take off the table that the British stop impressing our soldiers. And we're like, look, you can continue, you continue to do that. Just give us our land back is essentially uh, what the, the Americans are going to ask for. Uh, Great Britain says, OK, fine. Uh, well, you continue to let us do what we're doing out of the ocean. We'll give you that territory back and we'll stop helping the Native Americans. This is the betrayal of the Native Americans that I was talking about, right? They were promised their own country. They risked everything, right? They knew like with this foreign power uh, was going to help them. They you know, get their own country. So they sided with them. But then as soon as it wasn't convenient for the British anymore, the British bounced. And when they bounced, all of a sudden now the natives were left without the support, without the material support with guns and ammunition and food. Uh, they fought in the war, their braves died. And so they're just, there's just not enough people left, enough Native American soldiers, we could call them, but braves is probably the better word. Uh, to resist uh, Americans forcing resettlement on the on the natives, and so uh, this is just devastating for Net Native American populations, you know. And you know they were promised their own country, and the British, the first chance they got, just were like, "Yeah, too bad," and 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 walked away. And I like, I just, ugh, I just, just you got to feel for them, right? So. Peace. Yes. Wonderful. So how does that actually work? We're still fighting in the United States. Remember, this is a time period before cell phones and email. They can't just call up the, the people fighting and say, hey, yo, the war is over. Put down your weapons. Right. They can't do that. What do they have to do? They have to like write it out. They got to put it on a boat. That boat has to sail across the ocean to get to the United States and, uh, you know, we got to get all of that information to those generals. That way that takes forever, right? And so uh, the, the fight keeps coming. And so the Treaty of, of Ghent gets signed, but unaware of that, the British soldiers uh, start to attack New Orleans. Now, General Andrew Jackson, Old Hickory, will be tasked with defending New Orleans. So he's going to take his militia from Tennessee. He's going to march them down in New Orleans uh, and uh, essentially take over the city of New Orleans. Now, the city of New Orleans, uh, you know, they've kind of got their own mixed loyalties. It's a French city. It is just, we just bought it, right? They don't think of themselves as Americans. You know, the idea that this, you know, American guy that's you know really from really humble origins. This backcountry guy is going to come down to New Orleans and tell them what to do. You know, there's just like they're not necessarily going to have that. Uh, but when Andrew Jackson gets there, he very quickly uh, pulls in the the leaders of New Orleans. Essentially, tells them like, "Hey, look, the British are coming. We're, we're kind of." figuring this out. We're going to have to pull everybody together and build up the defenses of the city. Uh, and he's actually able to rally the city to his cause, which nobody really kind of expected uh, would happen. Um, 
And uh, he's going to be able to build up a, a very good defensive network. Uh, he's going to hire local pirates uh, that know the back swamp areas uh, to set out, uh, you know, kind of uh, search parties to see where the British are going to land. And so we can have some heads up of where they're going to attack. And he will successfully be able to uh, defeat the British at the Battle of New Orleans. Now, the war's over, so this isn't going to may have any impact on the peace treaty. The peace treaty is already signed, but it is going to have a, a, an effect on the American psyche, right? All of a sudden now, because we won the last battle, we're really going to feel like we won this war. And so, uh, you know, it, it keeps New Orleans, our, New Orleans ours. That's super important because economically it, it's one of the most valuable cities in the country, right? Because it controls trade down the Mississippi. Uh, but, uh, you know, even more important, uh, it, you know, it really unites the country and, and, you know, there's this like uptick in pride and being an American that, yeah, we beat the British, you know, twice, like how great are we? Uh, and that, that is something to actually, uh, you know, to celebrate and to feel proud about, you know, we were able to defeat the, you know, the single most powerful military in the world, uh, those times, right? Now, uh, what are the results of the war? Well, one, it's devastating to Native Americans. Uh, they're just resistance. There'll still be some resistance, but uh, it'll be minor resistance because there's just not enough experienced braves left. Uh, you know, they've got, you got to think about it, man. Uh, you know, from the, the French and Indian Wars, the you know the Revolutionary War, uh, you, you see the, you know, the uh, the War of 1812, just all of these different battles have really exhausted Native American resources. They're just not, you know, and then you pile on the, the disease and smallpox uh, that have decimated Native American populations. There's just not enough uh, Native Americans left to put up much of a fight. Uh, the other thing that the War of 1812-ish uh, uh, ushers in is the era of good feelings between Great Britain and the United States. Uh, we start to become friends again. Once the British start to realize it's in their best interest to be our friend, they become very friendly uh, with us. And that makes sense. They're not going to control us again. That is clear after the War of 1812. They're not going to be able to chip away territory from us. They're not going to be able to completely reconquer us. And so what they start to realize is we have more in common than we have uh, uh, not in common. And so, you know, we're English speaking. Uh, we're mostly Protestant significantly Protestant religion. Uh, you know, we're both democratic and, you know, our economies are closely, closely tied. I mean, we're great. We buy all kinds of stuff from Great Britain during this time period. And so good relationships between these two nations become, you know, very important. And so uh, we start to become BFFs. Uh, if you don't know what that means, it means best friends forever. So uh, we start to become BFFs and, uh, you know, that really, that relationship really holds true all the way to today. You know, we are, they're one of our closest allies. And uh, because of the Hartford Convention, uh, we will see the end of the Federalist Party. And so bye-bye uh, Federalists, uh, you're going to have to reorganize. Okay, uh, that is the end of our lecture today. I will see you again shortly. Thank you for your time.